Hello everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Tamil Selvan Muthusamy. I'm a consultant cardiologist, consultant interventional cardiologist. I have special interest in heart failure as well. I practice as a consultant cardiologist at the Cardiovascular Central KL uh, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And uh, today we're going to talk about heart failure, a paradigm shift. Uh, without further ado, I would like to move on to the lecture. And as you know, heart failure is such a common clinical condition. Approximately 1-2% to 2 of the adult population in developed countries has heart failure with a prevalence rising above 10% among persons uh, who are 70 years of age or older. And the incidences of uh, new cases are on the rise everywhere in the world. Um, and more alarmingly, the mortality rate for patients with chronic heart failure is as high as 50% at five years post-diagnosis. So this, in many circumstances, I think, is, uh, gives rise to a more adverse mortality outcome than cancers, some of the cancers that we, uh, we know. Um, as you can see, this is increasing prevalence. And if you looked at the age group of patients presenting with heart failure, um, particularly in Southeast Asia and, in, in uh, example, in Malaysia, um, the, uh, the age group uh, um, who present uh, are, tend to be younger than in Western population. So our morbidity and mortality from heart failure is higher and we tend to be younger as well. Um, uh, the, there are two types of heart failures as you know, maybe we can even classify it to even three but for this discussion we will keep it simple and we know there is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In other words, the ejection fraction is low and very often the LV is dilated and there are uh, cases of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a more complex diagnosis with uh, very poor outcome. This particular lecture will, will concentrate more on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But as you can see both these types of heart failure are associated with similar high levels of mortality. And unlike heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the graph that you can see on the right, um, it shows that over the last two decades we have improved outcomes significantly, but however that progress in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has been rather disappointing. And I think it's important to look at the decline in systolic function which uh, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction uh, with activation of three major neurohemoral uh, hemoral system. As you can see the first neurohemoral system that is elevated is sympathetic nervous system where there is uh, up, uh, up regulation of epinephrine, norepinephrine and there is stimulation of alpha, beta 1 and beta 2 uh, uh, receptors resulting in uh, uh, vasoconstriction, an increase in uh, RAAS activity, in other words, uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity, vasopressin activity, increasing heart rate and contractility. The, the second uh, 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 neurohemoral system that is uh, elevated is renin angiotensin aldosterone system, where there is uh, upregulation of angiotensin 2 and which results again in vasoconstriction, elevation of blood pressure, increasing sympathetic tone, increased production of aldosterone um, and focal hypertrophy and focal fibrosis. Now there is a third neurohemoral system which has been identified and has made a huge difference in the way we treat is the natriuretic peptide system which I shall talk a little more along the lecture. Now, the sustained overactivation of the RAS has detrimental effect on heart failure. As you can see, an elevation of angiotensin 2 via uh, 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 conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 results in um, uh, increase in hypertrophy fibrosis, increase in sympathetic tone, increase in aldosterone levels and sodium and water retention. Uh, there is also vasoconstriction and water absorption via vasopressin stimulation. All these results in cardiac remodeling, myocardial necrosis, 
increasing in heart rate, contractility, blood volume, uh, increasing in blood pressure and, uh, and so on. Um, and the RAA suppression is an effective strategy in treating heart failure. And the RAS is activated in heart failure initially a compensatory and subsequently a pathological uh, uh, um, uh, uh, event that occurs. Uh, as you can see that the stimulation increases the biological action which results in uh, focal myocardial hypertrophy, uh, cardiac apoptosis, uh, fibrosis. There is obviously vasoconstriction which is detrimental, um, sodium and water retention uh, uh, due to aldosterone release and of course the sympathetic tone is increased due to elevation or no referee, no referee release. And the overactivation of the renin angiotensin system and the sympathetic nervous system is detrimental uh, in heart failure, it reduces ejection fractions and underpins the basis of our therapy for the last two decades. Now, based on this, the intervention for heart failure, in other words, therapy for heart failure, has been based on trials intervening on the two detrimental uh, uh, neurohemoral system, uh, namely the sympathetic system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And as you can see, there are landmark trials in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And as you can see that this started between uh, in the early 1990s and we have made uh, good progress over the last several years. And uh, these trials can be, can be divided into trials which uh, involves renin angiotensin system, trials which involve aldosterone system, trials which involves uh, uh, a reduction in the sympathetic overactivation uh, and as you can see they are um, uh, resulted in improvement in the current improvement uh, and reduction in morbidity mortality that we see today. I like to run through this uh, uh, giving examples of uh, these trials and I think the the, the, the ACE inhibitor was the first trials to be, to be published uh, in the early 1990s and, uh, and, uh, and an example of, this, of it will be solved treatment where ACE inhibitor uh, significantly reduced the risk of mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection pressure. As you can see here that the primary outcome was a reduction in all-cause mortality and it was uh, in a patient using an enolapril dose of up to 18, 20 milligrams daily, there was a significant 16% uh, relative risk reduction, uh, which was highly statistically significant, underpinning the, uh, 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 our, uh, uh, our use of ACE inhibitors in heart failure as a mandatory medication over the last two decades. And um, an example of a, um, intervention involving the sympathetic system will be a CB2 trial, where beta blockers, bisoprolol, significantly reduce all-cause mortality again in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. As you can see in this trial, that the primary outcome again was all-cause mortality, and there was a 34% relative risk reduction, which was highly significant, underpinning the importance of beta blockade in heart failure therapy in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction therapy. Now. Um, the emergence of ARBs uh, um, uh, was mainly uh, as an alternative to ACE inhibitors and as we know that they are of equipotent to ACE inhibitors in terms of their efficacy in uh, heart failure therapy. A charm alternative is candosartan uh, uh, against um, a placebo in ACE intolerant patient significantly reduce CV mortality and morbidity in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. As you can see here, the primary outcome was composite CV mortality and heart failure hospitalization, which had a 30% relative risk reduction, which was highly significant. And similarly, charm edit, uh, which is a combination of ACE inhibitor and ARB, also showed there was composite CV mortality and heart failure hospitalization in patients in combination of ACE inhibitors and ARB against patients who are on ACE inhibitor alone. But however, the benefits are predominantly, the small benefits are predominantly driven by, not by mortality reduction, but by merely heart failure hospitalization. And um, 
uh, although it was a small relative risk reduction, it was significant. Um, the, the, it is not necessarily the most uh, popular combination therapy as the uh, adverse events of hyperkalemia uh, uh, and renal dysfunction uh, may, um, uh, may make it difficult uh, and may uh, reduce the, 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 the combined uh, the benefit that one may perceive. And uh, the use of MRE, mineral or corticoid renin uh, uh, aldosterone system, significantly reduced the risk of CV mortality and hospitalization in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Emphasis heart failure is one such study which showed that the composite of CV mortality and heart failure hospitalization was significantly reduced. A 37% relative risk reduction was noted. And uh, uh, there were earlier trial rails uh, which showed a similar benefit. Uh, but the uh, criticism of the RAILS trial was uh, rather low use of beta blockers in that particular trial. In emphasis heart failure, there was a high proportion of patients who received uh, good maximal therapy. So therefore, um, in addition to that, uh, the use of epilirinone, which is a, a MRA antagonist, showed significant reduced risk of CV mortality and hospitalization. Um, Despite the best of efforts, as you can see, the mortality remains high uh, um, uh, with the initiation of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, MRA and ARB. And you can see the, the high level of mortality. So therefore, we need new therapies. Um, and as I uh, informed you earlier, the third important system is the natriuretic peptide system, which has, uh, is really driven uh, by the fact that heart is almost like an endocrine organ releasing a peptide which is called natriuretic peptide uh, which is released in response to mechanical stretch of the myocardium. And these uh, uh, peptides seem to counter some effects of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone stimulation. And um, as you can see that uh, they, there are, there are uh, atrial natriuretic peptide, uh, B type natriuretic peptide, and C type natriuretic peptide. And um, they are, however, their half life in circulation varies anything between 2 minutes to 20 minutes. The important thing about these peptides are they have an opposing effect to uh, the renin angiotensin system regulation. Here, in op opposing to vasoconstriction, that is, vasorelaxation increased diuresis, reduced proliferation, reduced hypertrophy, reduced fibrosis, and reduced RAS activity with reduction in sympathetic tone. And in other words, all pointing towards an opposing effect, a more beneficial effect. As you can see, the natriuretic peptides mediate a wide range of physiological effects by their receptors, and they appear to be uh, cardioprotective. Now, the the natural peptide system completely opposed those of the RAS system, as you can clearly see here. That there is vasodilatation by increasing natriuretic peptides compared to vasoconstriction by increasing RAS overactivation in heart failure. Um, the problem is, is the natriuretic peptides which have short duration of action are cleared by the NPRC and degraded by a protease called naprilisin. As you can see here, the inactivation are uh, uh, driven by the naprilisin, uh, increasing the circulatory level of these peptides. The natriuretic peptides are cleared by uh, uh, the NPRC and naprilisin, as you can see here. Uh, and the naprilisin is not only uh, involved in reduction of a uh, clearance of ANP, BNP, and CNP, but they do also uh, are involved in the uh, clearance of angiotensin 2. Now, so the other substrate that they degrade are angiotensin 2 and vasoactive peptides really very relevant for the cardiovascular physiology. Um, so naprilisin inhibition must be accompanied by simultaneous RAAS blockade. Otherwise, that you would re increase uh, the uh, uh, available natriuretic peptides, but at the same time increase 
the angiotensin 2 levels as the degradation of the angiotensin 2 uh, will be reduced. So therefore, uh, this uh, 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 simultaneous blockade gives rise to a, uh, an increase in pep natriuretic peptides and reduce angiotensin 2 peptides. Um, so we, we also know that NEPRIL is in hydrolysis, ANP, BNP and CNP, but not anti-pro-BNP which is a precursor. So uh, this fact is important if we were to use some of the biomarkers for efficacy of therapy, uh, uh, and you, uh, uh, particularly with the use of a nepralysin inhibitor, you would use anti-pro-BNP rather than ANP or BNP. So the evolution of pharmacological approaches in a heart failure, as you can see, is to use this combination of a nepralysin inhibitor uh, together with a angiotensin 2 inhibitor uh, to elevate the available peptide levels which results in vasodilatation and uh, lots of opposing effect to activation of the renin angiotensin system. So the simultaneous use of uh, 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 sacubitril valsartan uh, which has got a nepralysin inhibitor and uh, which has got a one-to-one -one molecule of valsartan um, in the combination, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fundamental basis uh, of new therapy for heart failure. And the simultaneous uh, use of this, uh, uh, this combination therapy results in uh, a positive effect by increasing uh, um, the available natriuretic peptides which have a positive effect on natriuresis, vasodilatation, reduce hypertrophy, reduce sympathetic outflow and simultaneously reduction in the angiotensin 2 reduces uh, uh, the detrimental effect of the REA system. So the simultaneous inhibition of this nepralysin and suppression of the REA system has complementary effect as you can clearly see on this slide, uh, in one end, it increases vasodilatation, natriuretic and diuretic effects, uh, reducing hypertrophy, proliferation, sympathetic outflow, reduction in aldosterone secretion and detrimental effects on vascular remodeling. And a similar effect by reducing uh, or suppressing the RAAS mediated effects. The one of the important things is the, the nepralysin inhibitor does uh, uh, have an effect on bradykinin breakdown. If in the earlier trials of uh, omapatrilat where ACE inhibitor was used uh, and together with the nepralysin inhibitor um, resulted in unacceptable uh, angioneurotic edemas due to a very high bradykinin uh, levels uh, due to the fact that uh, ACE inhibitors inhibit bradykinin breakdown as well as natriuretic uh, 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 NEP. Um, whereas uh, with a combination of uh, uh, angiotensin 2 like an ARB, the bradykinin levels are not elevated. Therefore, that um, the, uh, the, the uh, angioneurotic uh, adverse events are minimized uh, with this combination rather than an ACE inhibitor combination. Um, so the, this hypothesis was tested uh, and proven on paradigm heart failure study, which was a prospective comparison of angiotensin receptor uh, and nepralysin inhibitor with ACE inhibitor to determine the impact of mortality and morbidity in heart failure. Uh, the paradigm heart failure study design showed patients were single blind active running period, uh, looking at the uh, available tolerability uh, uh, of the drugs tested and alapril 20 milligrams uh, and um, uh, LC, LCZ696 which is sacubitril valsartan 100 milligrams BD and increased to 200 milligrams BD. Uh, following the uh, run-in period, patients did double blind treatment period between um, LCZ696 200 milligram twice daily and enalapril 10 milligram twice daily. Enalapril was chosen as the comparator as the its ACE inhibitor. Enalapril was shown to reduce mortality in broad spectrum of heart failure uh, 
uh, with reduced ejection fraction patients as you can see here uh, and, uh, and hence it was one of the best ACE inhibitors to be chosen. Uh, the paradigm heart failure key inclusion criteria included patients in New York heart classification functional 2 to 4 but predominantly patients with functional class 2 uh, with very small numbers in patients with functional class 4 and they had to have the ejection fraction of less than 40 percent. Uh, the BNP or anti-pro BNP levels as follows um, uh, more than 150 or more than 100 and hospitalization for heart failure within the last 12 months. Um, patients with more than four weeks of stable treatment with ACE inhibitors or ARB and a beta blocker. Um, aldosterone antagonists should be considered for almost all patients. The primary outcome was cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization um, and uh, there are obviously uh, other secondary endpoints um, and uh, these are the uh, clinical outcomes that were being uh, exploratory objectives um, in terms of clinical outcomes, um, times to occurrence of CV death, hospitalization, um, time to treatment failure, uh, time to new onset diabetes and so on. They also looked at renal function, quality of life and biomarkers of pharmacokinetics of, uh, of the drug. And these were all exploratory objectives and they are not the primary objectives of the study. Um, there, there were obviously safety endpoints looking at serious adverse events, hyperkalemia, symptomatic hypotension, uh, increase in serum creatinine, angioedema and so on. The paradigm heart failure patients were particularly a group of patients who were well treated at baseline level as you can see that uh, in terms of beta blocker use that more than 90 percent of the patients uh, in paradigm heart failure received beta blockers and almost 60 to 70 percent received MRA. So they were really well treated patients. And the primary uh, endpoint was uh, sacubitril valsartan. Uh, which is ARNI significantly reduced death from CV cause of first hospitalization for heart failure by a relative risk reduction of 20%. The numbers needed to treat was merely 21 patients. And if you look at both uh, primary endpoint, which is uh, independently the cardiovascular death as well as heart failure hospitalization was significantly reduced. As you can see, uh, the numbers needed to treat what was respectively uh, 31 and 36. Uh, and if you look at all cause mortality, there was a relative risk reduction of 16%, which was highly significant in the all cause mortality reduction. And the safety events showed, although there were slightly more uh, um, cases of hypotension in patients with um, treated with uh, sacubitril valsartan, but however, the rest of the parameters, particularly the renal endpoints were not significantly different. They were uh, certainly not the angioedemas either, proving that it is a safe drug to be used. The summary of, of the results showed that primary outcome, there was a 20% reduction of CV death or heart failure hospitalization, a 20% reduction in CV mortality, 21% reduction in heart failure hospitalization. There were secondary outcomes, uh, which were all-cause mortality reduction, and uh, quality of life, spare, uh, life uh, indicators were better with the use of sacubitril valsartan. Um, and there was no significant difference in incidence of new onset atrial fibrillation, no significant difference in protocol defined decline in renal function between the treatment groups. Um, uh, so therefore, sacubitril valsartan has taken its place as one of the major advancement in treatment of heart failure. And there's a recent publication uh, from a DAPA heart failure and basically this is DAPA gliflozin in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and as you can see the baseline treatment they are particularly well treated patient either they are on ACE inhibitors, ARB or ARNI and they all receive 96 percent of them receive beta blockers and the MRA used in these particular uh, patients were high at 71 percent and um, they were the use of ICDs and CRTs were equal in both groups. And the key inclusion criteria was symptomatic heart failure, 
less than ejection fraction, less than 40%, and there were anti-pro BNP more than 600. If hospitalized for heart failure within the last 12 months, anti-pro BNP level of more than 400. The key exclusion criteria if the GFR was less than 30, and if they had symptomatic hypotension with a systolic or systolic blood pressure less than 95. The primary endpoint was worsening heart failure event or cardiovascular death. Worsening heart failure event is defined as unplanned heart failure hospitalization or an urgent heart failure visit requiring intravenous therapy. And the primary composite outcome was highly significant with a 26% reduction in the primary outcome of CV death, heart failure hospitalization or heart urgent heart failure visit. The numbers needed to treat were merely 21%. The components of the primary outcome looked independently showed the worsening heart failure event was also significantly reduced uh, at, with a hazard ratio of 0.7 um, as well as the reduction in the cardiovascular death which was again significant. The all-cause death was again significant with a hazard ratio of 0.83. Now and interestingly when they looked at all patients whether on their base uh, on their grounds whether they are diabetic or non-diabetic and you can see whether they were diabetic or non-diabetic SGLT2 inhibitor dapagliflozin performed well whether they were diabetic or non-diabetic in treatment of heart failure therefore this is the first time a diabetic medication has been used in non-diabetic to reduce heart failure endpoints uh, my conclusions uh, would be this is a major step forward in the management of heart failure in more than a decade with two publication in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction uh, paradigm heart failure pay trial and the DAPA heart failure trial. Um, this is indeed a definite paradigm shift. It is an exciting, exciting as the publication of consensus trial in the early 90s. We are addressing all three pathways. In fact, the fourth pathway will be a SGLT2 inhibition pathway in reducing or improving outcome in the heart failure. With that, I'd like to uh, end my lecture. Thank you.